So last week we started a little short series for Christmas called The Gospel According to Christmas Carols. Last week we looked at Mary's song. This week we're going to look at uh, Zechariah's. Next week we'll look at Simeon's. Uh, When I've done this before, I looked at traditional carols, and so that's why the title. But I thought this year it would be kind of cool to just look at what does... What did the people who were actually there sing about? I think that would teach us uh, a lot. And I like a lot of our traditional Christmas carols. There are some that are are, uh, really, really deep and have great theology and great words. There are some that, hmm, maybe not. (laughs) And so uh, you kind of have to pick and choose if you want to actually kind of stay on track. But I think we'd never go wrong by going back to what the Spirit inspired and what the Spirit said through people and wanted us to actually focus on. I think that's a good place to start. So that's where we're starting this year. So last week, again, we looked at Mary's. And that's, you were talking about things that are hard to top. It's hard to top Mary's song. And uh, and we, of course, heard the words of that just a few minutes ago before the Lord's Supper. It's just incredible what she sang. However, the same Spirit wrote a couple more. So we're going to look at Zechariah's today. Zechariah, of course, you know, is the father of John the Baptist. And a lot of the people assumed that it would be Zechariah Sr. and Zechariah Jr., but that's not the way it worked out. Instead, God had other plans. And so when he had his name given to him, it was not given to him by his parents. John the Baptist was named by God. The angel Gabriel told them, this is what you're going to name your kid. That's, That's how that happened. Just like Jesus, you know, Mary and Joseph didn't pick Jesus out of the air. God said, this is what you're going to name him. And so that's kind of an interesting aspect of all this too, because whenever God chose to give somebody a name, you'd better pay attention to that person. Every single time in scripture where he takes somebody and changes what they're known by or gives them their name even before they're born, it's because God has big plans and it's his way of putting his thumbprint, so to speak, on that person and on what they're going to do. And so that's, that's kind of the background of John the Baptist and his name. Now, I want to look first, though, at the circumstances here, because uh, the circumstance of John the Baptist is just as miraculous as the birth of Jesus. It's just as miraculous as the birth of uh, Isaac, and it's actually very similar to Isaac. It, it's almost as if you might have had a a, uh, a shadow and a reality thing, as the Hebrew writer talks about with several biblical events. You would have an Old Testament shadow and a New Testament reality. It's almost like that. All right, Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Can I just say, would you not like that to be said about you? I mean, this isn't like somebody said, oh, they're really great people. This is Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, being told by God and by witnesses, because Luke also got a lot of things from from the witnesses that actually knew these people. And he says, these people were incredible. Righteous, obedient, faithful people. Sometimes we read our New Testaments and we read the Gospels like everybody in them was a Pharisee. Like everybody was either a Pharisee, a Sadducee, or a demoniac, or, you know, naked guy running through the cemeteries and things like that. And we miss how many good, strong, faithful, God-fearing, God-believing, God-trusting people there were, people of faith. But God didn't miss them. He put them in there. We just don't always read quite right, do we? Here this is, a couple that are righteous, it says in verse 6, before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child. That's, that's good to remember. If you're struggling with that and you're going, God, why? Just understand, it's, it's not because you aren't loved. It's not because you aren't faithful. Uh, look at what happens with this couple. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. That's why I say it reminds us so much of Abraham and Sarah. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So he takes his turn. That's the way the priesthood worked at the time. And um, it wasn't one priest served the whole time. They would kind of rotate in and out. 
They chose by lot that way. Uh, their belief was and practice was that this way God has a hand in choosing who, who's going to serve right now. And so this was his time. And it's certainly apparent from what happens that Zechariah was indeed providentially chosen to be there that day because he goes to work and look at what God does. The whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense and there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. That seems to be the normal thing, doesn't it? The men on Wednesday nights were studying the, uh, the spiritual beings of the Bible. And so if, uh, if you want to join us for that, you're more than welcome. It's been very fascinating so far. And we've looked at you know, how God uses angels and messengers and, and how he has these spiritual beings. We don't even give a whole lot of thought. Cherubim, seraphim, all of that kind of stuff. And one thing that's in common is when people would see these messengers of God, they were scared. That's the normal reaction. Look at it from Genesis to maps, and you will see that over and over again, that people were frightened. We don't know exactly what they looked like, but apparently they were imposing figures and are imposing figures when they want to be. And so this angel appears to Zechariah there, and just imagine this for a second. You're a priest, you're on duty. It's the hour of, of incense, which means it's all about prayer. It's all about intercession. It's a very humble approach to the Lord in prayer. And there he is serving at the altar. And all of a sudden, somebody he didn't expect to be there is there. And however you know an angel is an angel, he knew. He knew. And he's scared to death. And wouldn't you be? What if it was your turn to, time to uh, get the communion together for Sunday morning? And you go back to the kitchen and you're there and you're, you're preparing all of that and you're making sure that they're all full and, and like I had to do as a teenager once on a Sunday night, you're making sure that they haven't already turned into wine, not miraculously, but by the fuzz and fermentation of a West Texas afternoon. Uh, that happened to me once and I was too young to know any better, so I just served it all. I, you know, I did, y'all take this. Poor people were having to look for which one had the least beard growth on the thing. It was, it was weird. Open that thing up and, you know. Anyway, you're back there, and, and you're getting that together and just checking everything. You turn around from the refrigerator, and here is Mr. Intimidating Glowing Angel. I'm going to assume the glow, because they never just thought, oh, this is a big guy. They always knew this is something more, someone more. Just imagine for a second that happens to you. And then he starts talking. Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him, verse 13. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And so he gets this news, just like with Abraham, just like with Mary and Joseph. You're about to have a kid, and you're going to have a son. And Zechariah, just like all those other people, must have been flooded immediately with and how's that going to work? Because he knows, okay, it says they're advanced in years. That was really polite language for they were getting really old and this was not going to happen except by God. This is one of those circumstances where God works in a way and through people not to show, oh, look what great people these were, but to show, look what a mighty God we serve. So he didn't use the people who were proud of themselves. He used the people who were humble and faithful and who would never have been expected for this to even be possible. So if you ever look at yourself and you say, I don't know if God can use me because I don't have anything, your willingness to admit that means you are maybe the most useful person in the room. Okay? John, or excuse me, Zechariah would never have seen himself at this point in his life as being the father of somebody who would serve the Lord. His day had come, and his day had gone. His wife Elizabeth's day had come and gone. This wasn't just a late child. This is a miraculous child. Well, because of all of that, John goes, mm, I don't know. I'm not sure we can do that. I don't, know, I don't know about all of that. And he has some doubts. We know that because the Spirit wrote it down. Now, think about that, too. 
what if the Lord inspired somebody to write your doubts down and write them where people for thousands of years would sit there and go, wow, he, he didn't do that one right. I'm, I'm always so glad the Bible's already done. <laughs> Aren't you? Because then we might be in there and it might, you know, you don't know how that's going to fall. All right, so here's Zechariah. Verse 14, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great before the Lord. That's cool to hear about your kid. And he must not drink wine or strong drink and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he was Church of Christ. Even that, I'm kidding, I'm kidding with you. Uh, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. That's actually, it's because he's going to have a special vow. Okay, Zechariah wasn't under that vow, but his son John would be. This is actually an indication of just a set aside, very special purpose for him. And he will turn many children to the, of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready the Lord for the Lord, a people prepared. All words that Zechariah knew. That last part, Zechariah knows these words. He's heard these before in the synagogue and in the temple when they would be read from the scrolls of the word of God, that this was the promise of God for thousands of years, hundreds of years, hundreds and hundreds of years. They have clung to these words that eventually there would be another Elijah. There would be someone who would come in the spirit of Elijah and he would make way the, the way for the Lord, make ready the way for the Lord. And they cling to that. They had to cling to it because in this time and in times before, they were a people who did not look like they were the winners and the victorious people of the world. They were a country that had been beaten and beaten and beaten and beaten. They had victories in their past when they trusted the Lord. But they also had all of these ups and downs where they got distracted by money and power and greed and everything else, where they got unfaithful with idolatry, chasing after foreign gods and foreign women and all of these things. And over and over again, they'd blown it. And every time they blew it, the covenant that they made came back around to bite them in the butt. Sorry, but it did. The covenant had both blessings and cursings, and those cursings were when you get so idolatrous, disobedient, and everything else, God will discipline you, and they knew what that was like. They had had their northern kingdoms conquered by the Assyrians and dragged off, and we refer to them as the lost kingdoms. They had been so idolatrous and melded in with the world around them so much, virtually disappeared. Judah themselves had their own idolatry, and they had been smashed by the Babylonians, enslaved by them, and dragged off. They had been through humiliation and pain and oppression and slavery and loss. The Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, and now in his day, the Romans. And every day they walked through their city of Jerusalem. And they are reminded of the oppression, the beating they've taken, and the humiliation they've been through and are going through. And the only thing that they have that shines as a light out there somewhere in the future is a promise from God. And Zechariah, here's the words, you're going to have a son. And that son is going to come and he is going to come in the spirit of Elijah. He is going to turn people back to God. He is going to bring you back to freedom by pointing people to the promised Messiah. The one that God said in Genesis 3, that far back, and Genesis 3 might have his heel struck, but he will crush the serpent's head. And they clung to that hope day after day is it a coincidence that it's during the time of prayer that day that God reveals this? I bet it's not. Someone in that crowd, if not Zechariah himself, had probably just said, oh, Lord, you got to deliver us. You've got to send the Messiah. And Zechariah gets the answer. He's coming soon, and your son will be his messenger to get people ready. An absolutely incredible promise. And because of that, Zechariah, like Mary, 
just bursts out in song. So let's look at what, what he sings. This is later in chapter 1. Can you click that forward, please? This ain't working. <clears throat> All right. Let's start. I'm going to read the whole thing, and then we'll go back and look at some aspects of this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets of old, that, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise will visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. He comes out with this song, and the circumstances surrounding that are the baby has been born. Elizabeth delivers the baby, and on the eighth day, they go to the temple to have the dedication of the child to God, as every Hebrew child was going to be dedicated to God. And being a boy, he was going to be circumcised. And I've always liked, if you ever wonder why that would be, I've always liked Max Lucado's explanation from this from about 30 years ago. He said his take on circumcision is, is this, that God wanted his people to understand that there was no part of your life so personal and so private that it is not changed by your relationship with God. I think that's the best explanation I've ever heard. Hopefully it's right, but it's the best explanation that I've ever heard. And so this child is taken to the temple to have all of this done. And while they're there, of course, part of the ceremony would be, and what's the child's name going to be? And so everybody is sitting there thinking, Zechariah Jr., right? That's what everybody thinks. And I think this is really kind of funny because they're actually all speculating. It's as if everybody else had some kind of a stake in what the baby's name was going to be. Well, surely it's going to be Zechariah Jr. I mean, this is so cool. They... Old people like that can't even have babies. you got to name him Zechariah. And, of course, John the Baptist, or John the Baptist, I keep doing that. Zechariah is not able to talk because of his disbelief. Remember, the angel struck him silent, he says, until the promise is fulfilled. When's the promise fulfilled? It's on this day in a very particular way. So here they are at the temple ready for the dedication they ask what the name is. Everybody thinks they know what it's going to be. But Elizabeth, who can talk, says, baby's name's going to be John. And everybody goes, well, they ain't got no John in their family. Why would, why would they name their kid John? Surely it's going to be Zechariah or Zeki Jr. or whatever you would call him. Why would it be John? And I think that's hilarious, but they all want to pitch in. And then John, or is it, I'm going to keep doing it. Zechariah says, bring me a slate. And so they bring him a little writing slate, and he writes down on the slate, his name is John. Little side lesson, husbands, back up your wives. Okay, I think that was the example there. No, he writes, his name is John. It's not an accident what happens next. As soon as he does that and they name the baby John, Zechariah's tongue is unleashed. Why do you think that happens when it happens? Why wasn't it at the birth? Because he, he trusted, he believed, and he took action based on his belief. See, the promise wasn't fulfilled and everything wasn't done until Zechariah followed through. I think there's a lesson there for us. When you trust God, you follow through on God's promise and you trust him and stand by what he's called you to do. In this case, what God had called Zechariah to do was to trust him and when the promise would be fulfilled, to name him John. And he did. And when he did, he got his tongue unle unleashed again. Isn't that similar to some things for us? There are things that God calls us to, and we don't see 
all that there is to God's promise until we actually take some actual steps of faith. Just saying, I believe, okay, fine, I believe you, that's not enough. There are things we actually have to do. As Christians, Jesus said what? If you confess me before men, I will confess your name before my Father. The implication being, and Jesus says it out loud, but if you don't confess me, I'm not confessing you. There's a promise, but you, by faith, have to follow through on that promise. And that's true with our confession. That's true when we need to be forgiven of sins. First John, talking to Christians, says, you know, you're going to make mistakes. But if you will confess your sins to the Lord, what happens? He says, God who is faithful and just will forgive you your sins. He says, but if you deny them, you still got them. Because you're making God out to be a liar. And so there's a promise of grace and a promise of forgiveness, but it only comes through honesty. It only comes through humbling yourself and confessing that to God and seeking mercy. It doesn't just happen. John didn't get to speak again until John followed through on his faith. You can draw all kinds of conclusions there, uh, but there's so many times in life where this is the case. But faith is something that acts, and it's not something that uh, is just a a, a cognizant uh, assent to something. I don't just say, oh yeah, I agree to that. I make my life show I I agree with that. That's what James was getting at when he says, you know, you'll say, well, I have faith, and that's all words. He says, but I'm going to show you I have faith by what I do. Faith declares itself through its actions, and that's what happens here. The fact that he finally trusted and believed, he said, no, I don't get to pick this baby's name. This is not just any baby. What the angel said is true. God made this happen and God gets to name him. And through the faithful action of that, everything then is fulfilled, and he gets to sing his praises. And he does, doesn't he? Look at what he says in terms of his, uh, oh, it started working again, in terms of what uh, God has done. First, he says, I got to praise God. That's what that is. I got to bless the Lord. I got to praise God because he's been so good to us. And he goes through a few things. We won't go through them all, but he goes through a few things that God has done. One of them is, he says he's raised up a horn of salvation. And what does he mean by that? It means that he has raised up the horn and he's saying, I am coming to deliver you. And he blasts this this trumpet sound that shows that God is the deliverer and it's time. It's the same thing we wait for, isn't it? Because what will happen, according to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, at the coming of Christ, says he's going to blast a horn. There will be the trumpet sound, and the angels will shout, and we will be called up to meet the Lord. We're waiting for the same thing, for our time to hear the trumpet blast. Je- or Zechariah says, and with this promise fulfilled, we hear the trumpet blast. God is a deliverer. God is salvation. And he's done it for us. And then he starts describing what we are because of that. We are God's people. They were God's people. And what does all of this mean? First, in verse 71, he says, we're going to be saved. And in fact, most of us in this room, no salvation is ours. You've given your life to God in faith. You've been baptized in the name of Christ. And you know that you are God's. And every day you ought to get up with a salvation Praise to God, because you heard that trumpet call that called you to him in the first place. God made that possible. Faith made that possible. And faith moved you toward obedience to God. And we're a saved people. We're people who have been shown mercy. Every mistake we've ever made, every mistake you will make today, and every mistake you will make between now and the time you die has been bought and paid for with the blood of Christ. And God has shown you a way to mercy. Is that not incredible? And here Zechariah says, I can't believe I get to be a part of this. He's just going to be a dad, but that's not just a just, is it? We'll see that here in a second. 
but he gets to be a part of it. So do you. As you share that with your family, as you share that with friends and neighbors, you get to play the same role that, well, John the Baptist played, for that matter, not just Zechariah. We've been shown mercy. We are delivered from our sin and our slavery. It didn't go. Verse 74, look at it being delivered from the hand of our enemies, that we might serve him without fear. Satan constantly tries to give us new reasons to be afraid, doesn't he? As though we didn't have enough that we, we fall for that weakness. Constantly he tries to give us new reasons. Some of those are big picture things. Some of those things are very personal and only you know what they are for you. But the deliverance we get through Christ delivers us from those fears. Zechariah spent months, about nine probably, months in silence because of a moment of fear. How long have you lived in silence about the goodness of God because you were held captive too long to fear? So Zechariah is released from his fears, leans into his faith, and says this is going to be a whole lot better. Now we get to serve him without fear. What can the world even do to us? Why are we even worried about it? He makes us holy, all of us, through the mercy and the grace and the blood of Christ. We could sit there and give God a list of all the reasons why we're not holy, and he would give us one big one why we are made holy, and his name is Jesus. He makes us righteous. And he shows us how to walk in justice. I've said I'm going to hammer this home a lot. Righteousness and justice are the same thing. And so he makes us righteous and teaches us how to live in justice, how to treat people right, how to treat people fairly, how to stand up for those who need to be stood up for, which is very much the role of the Messiah and anybody who calls or anybody who is called by him into his kingdom. It's who we're called to be. Then he gets to look at his kid. He's standing there and, and has the kid in his arms. And he knows that his child has a holy, divine, eternity-impacting purpose. Isn't that what you want for your kid? Isn't that what you want for your grandkids? For those that would come after you that you may not ever even know, but that you've entrusted to your kids and grandkids? You want them to know they have a holy, righteous purpose in life. And Zechariah gets to hold his baby and know, my child is the Lord's. God's going to use him. He does not then just sit back and go, well, I guess I don't have to do anything. God's already got this one taken care of. A lot of parents make that mistake, don't they? Sometimes we do that by mistake. Well, God has providence. He'll make sure all that works out. No, he's given you a job to do. Look, even Zechariah has to do his job. Verse 80. As the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he, was, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Look at that again. The child grew and became strong in spirit. John the Baptist certainly strong in spirit is a good way to put it. It wasn't just because an angel announced his birth. It was because faithful parents raised him to be true to that calling. John could have failed. People sometimes fail their callings. Zechariah and Elizabeth could have said, yeah, but I'm not going to do that, and failed. You don't believe me? Ask Esau, who failed. Made God very upset because he denied his birthright. When he denied his birthright, he wasn't giving up inheritance he denied the fact that if he had not denied his birthright, it would have been through him that the Messiah came. He denied the promise, not just an inheritance. He denied the promise of God that it would be through that line. And in doing so, God had already prearranged because God knew his failure. But in doing so, it changed in that sense, the history of his family forever. Esau, which became Edom, is gone from the earth, does not exist. 
because he failed his calling. He rejected, let's be more accurate, he rejected his calling. Not Zechariah, not Elizabeth. They raised John, and they raised him in the Spirit, and they raised him faithfully, and they point him like an arrow to his target. Zechariah had a lot of reason to praise that day, but we have a lot of reason to praise that Zechariah was faithful after he learned his lesson, that John the Baptist was faithful in his calling because we have learned what faithful men really look like. We learn through Elizabeth and through Mary what faithful women really look like. And now that call is on us. Will we be the people that God has called us to be? Holy, righteous, receivers of mercy, givers of mercy. Will we be people who point the next generation, as they did John, into God's purpose and deeper into the kingdom? Make that commitment. 